When I was in Washington, D.C. for a conference in 2004, I visited the Corcoran Gallery on a free afternoon. I intended to skip their special exhibit on Norman Rockwell's The Four Freedoms, which was in town for the opening of the World War II Memorial. Rockwell is just kitsch, right? Not a serious artist. Well, I found myself straying into that hall by accident with plenty of time left, so I went ahead and looked around and was glad I did. There were some surprises. When I finally found a book about that exhibit, I thought this might make a good talk for the UUs. And then last December, while trying to sleep on a long flight to Europe, this talk began to take shape in my mind. In the beginning were Franklin Delano Roosevelt's words, or more significantly, his vision. For that's what the Four Freedoms were, a vision. In 1940, FDR saw that the U.S. would eventually have to enter the war, and he was also looking even further ahead to the peace that would come after. Because the treaty after World War I had, in fact, led to another war, FDR envisioned a peace that would last longer, envisioned a world much like the one described in Will Build a Land. In a speech in June of 1940, just days after Dunkirk, with Hitler controlling nearly all of Europe and isolationism rampant here in the US, FDR foresaw the eventual end to the conflict as the, quote, elimination of four fears. The fear of not being able to worship freely. The fear of losing one's freedom of expression. The fear of military arms. And the fear of fractured commerce among nations. A month later, at a press conference, Roosevelt transformed those four fears into four freedoms. Freedom of information, freedom of religion, freedom to express oneself, and freedom from fear. A newspaper reporter suggested freedom from want, which FDR immediately took up. Roosevelt used his State of the Union address in January of 1941 to persuade Congress to pass the Lend-Lease Act allowing the U.S. to provide arms to nations fighting the Axis powers. And this was 11 months before Pearl Harbor. During a speech writing session, after a long, thoughtful interlude staring at the ceiling, FDR stated the four freedoms as we know them now, the freedoms that the form that Sandra read to us just a few minutes ago. Curiously, the press took almost no notice of this part of his speech. Ironically, the Saturday Evening Post, Norman Rockwell's employer at the time, actually sneered, referring to, quote, the four horsemen of American freedom, a new deal for the whole world, paid for by America. <clears throat> In following months, most Americans couldn't name even one of FDR's designated four freedoms, despite active promotion by the government. After Pearl Harbor dragged the U.S. into the war, Norman Rockwell wanted to do something. But when he read the Four Freedoms pamphlet the government circulated, he recalled, I hadn't been able to get beyond the first paragraph. The language was so noble, platitudinous really, that it stuck in my throat. But inspiration finally came at three o'clock in the morning in the spring of 1942, when Rockwell remembered one of his neighbors speaking at the Arlington, Vermont town meeting the previous year. That neighbor had spoken against a popular motion but the rest of the citizens listened respectfully. That gave Rockwell an image for freedom of speech, along with the insight to show people living the four freedoms in simple everyday scenes. After developing some other sketches, Rockwell went to Washington to try to interest various government agencies in the pictures. One bureaucrat said, the last war, you illustrators did the post war, did the posters, but this time we're going to use fine arts men, real artists. Leaving Washington empty handed, <clears throat> Rockwell and a friend stopped off at Philadelphia to visit Ben Hibbs, the new editor of the Saturday Evening Post, who was immediately enthusiastic. Hibbs also had the idea to publish an essay on the page facing each painting. Three of the four essays are still worth reading, and you can find them with a Google search on Four Freedoms Essays. The pa paintings and essays were published in four consecutive issues of the Saturday Evening Post in February and March of 1943. So let's look at the images. 
I, and I do have permission to use them. The essay for freedom of speech by Booth Tarkington has not aged well. That's all I'll say. But the painting may be the strongest of the four. There's an early version of this illustration, which looks at the speaker straight on, not from below as this one does. But this arrangement makes the speaker's pose more heroic and puts the viewer in the meeting, somebody actually sitting there. The speaker obviously works with his hands. Note the fingernails. His clothes are grimy and worn in contrast to the white suited, white shirted men around him. We see at least three copies of the annual report from the town. Everyone has the same information. The image is not only about speaking though. The audience is clearly paying attention and listening. Notice all the eyes and all the ears. There's one gent in the lower left who is literally all ear. At first, I was surprised to learn that the speaker in the original meeting was on the minority side. And then I realized that that's exactly the point of freedom of speech, that you can't tell from the listeners which side he was on. Freedom of Worship was published next with an essay by historian and philosopher Will Durant. The essay comments on our founders coming here in order to worship as they chose, including choosing not to worship at all. Somehow though, that variety doesn't quite get into the painting, even though there is a crucifix and a, maybe an Eastern Orthodox or Jewish hat in the, lower, in the right foreground. One critic, perhaps fairly, calls this painting a dud. A striking item at the Corcoran Museum was a letter from a theater manager calling Roosevelt out. The manager asks why there are, and I use his labels, why there are no youths or children, no middle class or intellectual, the Negro or the Italian type. They are all facing in the same direction, he noticed, but he said, the distinction of human beings in a free country is that they face opposite directions, even toward different gods. Point taken, sir. In March of 1943, Freedom of Want appeared. This is probably the most famous of the four images. Certainly it's been imitated, parodied, and reimagined many times. Check out that turkey. In proportion to everything else, it is huge. This image has been criticized as sentimental and clearly out of step with grim realities like the still recent Great Depression. Nowadays, we might say it even exemplifies privilege, but that's only if you don't read the accompanying essay by Carlos Bulosan, a Filipino-American writer and itinerant laborer, speaking for those on the margins. That text was the most astonishing item I saw at the Corcoran, and I encourage you to read it. Here are just a few of those stirring sentences. But we are not really free unless we use what we produce. So long as the fruit of our labor is denied us, so long will want manifest itself in a world of slaves. It is only when we have plenty to eat that we begin to understand what freedom means. To us, freedom is not an intangible thing. When we have enough to eat, then, we have the time and ability to read and think and discuss things. Then we are not merely living, but also becoming a creative part of life. It is only then that we become a growing part of democracy. We are the mirror of what America is. If America wants us to be living and free, then we must be living and free. If we fail, then America fails. Strong words for the conservative Saturday Evening Post. And of course, they got some pushback. Enough so that six months later, they had to acknowledge in print that some readers were, quote, dubious. They imagined that the, for, that the freedom of want meant that people should be, quote, guaranteed against lacking anything that they have and desire at any given moment. The Post's editors felt it necessary to assure their readers that freedom from want was an ideal, like a chicken in every pot, and not a, quote, radical welfare scheme. Next, we have freedom from fear. Freedom from fear is a really complicated, challenging idea. Stephen Vincent Binet wrote the accompanying essay, which clearly articulates how fragile freedom from fear is and how important it is as a goal during wartime. 
That's another essay I strongly recommend that you read. I think it may even be better than the painting at outlining FDR's vision. Both FDR and Binet emphasized the need to think globally about fear. Binet wrote, when the Wright brothers made their first flights at Kitty Hawk, the world shrank. Fear and ignorance a thousand miles away may spread pestilence in our own town. One of FDR's advisors suggested that in the entire world was a little bit much. But Roosevelt said, the world is getting so small that even the people in Java are getting to be our neighbors now. Perhaps because the idea of freedom from fear is so complex, the illustration falls a little flat. The only tokens are, of fear are the words bombing and horror in the newspaper headline, and perhaps the limp doll on the floor. In retrospect, Rockwell himself said the picture was, quote, based on a rather smug idea. Painted during the bombing of London, it was supposed to say, thank God we are secure. Let's move on now to the question of what happened next. The paintings were instantly popular. And they were printed as posters, distributed far and wide, issued on postage stamps, and sent on a nationwide tour to promote the sale of war bonds, raising over $133 million. Norman Rockwell's paintings made FDR's vision of four freedoms real across America and in the world with two particularly far-reaching effects. First, there's the impact on Harry Truman, FDR's vice president, and himself the grandson of slave owners, who freely used the N-word in writing letters to his family. But he also had a strong feeling for the underdog, and having been an army captain in World War I, he understood war and soldiers. In the summer of 1946, he learned of a black veteran who was beaten and blinded in South Carolina, and two black veterans and their wives who were pulled from their car and killed in Georgia. And then he heard a detailed report from the NAACP about lynchings in the South and vowed instantly to do something. In December of 1946, realizing that black people in America were not free from fear, Truman issued an executive order called Freedom from Fear, creating the President's Commission on Civil Rights. It was charged with, among other things, proposing legislation to protect civil rights. In 1948, a presidential election year, he boldly desegregated the armed forces, letting the Dixiecrats fall where they may. The other immediate and worldwide impact of the Four Freedoms came through the work of Eleanor Roosevelt, whom Truman appointed as a US delegate to the United Nations. She described her, quote, solemn obligation to those who fought the war to make the peace so they can feel that moment, that maximum good has come from their sacrifice. In 1946, the UN established its Commission on Human Rights with Eleanor Roosevelt as its chair. And she also chaired the subcommittee that, that drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from which Sandra read our opening words this morning. So what was next for Norman Rockwell? Well, in a process that even the curators at his museum can't trace, he became increasingly socially progressive and willing to use his painterly skills and his well-established reputation to highlight social justice causes. Let's look at pictures again. Rockwell tried the, the freedom to worship theme again a couple of decades later with much more success in a painting called The Golden Rule. In preparing for it, Rockwell compiled a list of 10 different religions statements of the Golden Rule in alphabetical order from Buddhism to Zoroastrianism. Evidently, the Saturday Evening Post had lifted its ban on picturing black people by 1961 when this was their cover, so he didn't have to paint, paint over the black people, one of them a little girl with school books. But this illustration got him the only hate mail he received in 45 years with the Post. He left the Post and began working for Look Magazine in 1963, and he had also moved to Stockbridge, Massachusetts then. He already had an idea for his initial work for Look, one of his most famous paintings. This one is called The Problem We All Live With. Segregation had been thought of as a uniquely Southern problem, 
But by the time Rockwell used the word we in his title, all of us were implicated. The structure of this picture puts the viewer in the position of the mob on the same side as the person who threw the tomato. The racist graffiti is perhaps more shocking now than it was in 1964 when this was published. Yet I am somehow less surprised now to see those letters KKK than I would have been 20 or even 50 years ago. The painting depicts the arrival of Ruby Bridges, escorted by federal marshals to her school in New Orleans in 1960. She was the first black child to desegregate an elementary school in the South. Many people think Rockwell's painting is based on a photograph, but it is not. He planned, staged everything himself. He said it took 10 tomatoes to get the right splatter. The marshals, who appear to be marching in step, are posed so that we can see their badges and even the court order peeking out of the pocket of one of them. At least two of the men who posed for the painting were actual U.S. Marshals sent out from Boston as models. Another was Stockbridge Police Chief William J. Obanheim, who would later enjoy a bit of 60s theme fame as the Officer Obi of Arlo Guthrie's Alice's Restaurant. Rockwell made the interesting choice to show the marshals only from the shoulders down. The models may have been disappointed, he said, but if I'd shown the four faces, you wouldn't have seen the little girl. The guy knew what he was doing. A little later, Rockwell did another overtly political painting for Look, this time about the murders of three civil rights workers in Mississippi in 1963. In 1966, he used the same left-facing montage of faces as in the Freedom from, of Worship for a Look magazine cover, JFK's Legacy, the Peace Corps. It shows young faces, male, female, black, white, brown, all illuminated from the left. Then in 1968, about the time of the famous Democratic Convention in Chicago, Look published his painting, The Right to Know, it features a diverse mass of people solemnly facing an empty chair that might have been set out for a public hearing. The people represent a variety of ages and races, including a hippie couple, fringed best and flower in hair. The accompanying text said, those of us who stand here mean to watch those we put in the seats of power. In 1968, that was a warning and a sign of the times. This new politically engaged work disappointed Rockwell's older fans who wondered why he couldn't go on giving them, quote, those sweet old pictures like you used to do. But Rockwell didn't see it that way. He said, you can't make the good old days come back just by painting pictures about them. That kind of stuff is dead now, and I think it's about time. Even more startlingly, he declared in 1968, that pivotal year of protest, that he, quote, couldn't paint the four freedoms now. I just don't believe in it. Whoa. So if Rockwell quit believing in the four freedoms by 1968, what are we to make of them over 50 years later? I think they are now more rather than less relevant. I wasn't alive during World War II, but I've come to think of it as a time of incredible national unity, a powerful sense of common purpose. We are even more divided, more dangerously contentious in 2020 than we were in 1968. All four of FDR's and Rockwell's freedoms are aggressively under attack these days, which makes me more aware that they need defending. Freedom from fear is particularly under siege. Now we have political leaders telling us that we should be afraid, not that we should be free of fear. Those selling us fear tell us that only they can protect us. But here's what I've realized in thinking about <clears throat> these four freedoms. Fear is the only one we can as individuals do something about. If we can be manipulated in, into feeling afraid, we should also be able to step out of fear, at least to some degree. FDR's inaugural message in 1932 that quote, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, was intended to pull the country out of fear. Individual will, ours and our leaders, can free us from fear. Recalling that in FDR's first, free, first recall that in FDR's first vision, 
the freedoms were fears, fear of losing freedom of speech, fear of military arms, and so on, before he deftly turned those fears into freedoms. America is a country created as a vision, a noble vision that has always been hard to understand. Yes, that vision has been lived out on stolen land with enslaved labor, and it is a long way from being true for everyone. But the idea, the vision, persists. Whether it's the Puritans' City on a Hill, or Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, or Black Lives Matter, or the Rainbow Pride flag, FDR, Eleanor, Harry Truman, and Norman Rockwell all had a vision of why it was important to go into that war and why and how to create a more durable peace afterwards. The price of that war would be staggering, but they all thought the vision of four freedoms was worth it. Do we still think freedom is worth the cost? <laughs>